Welcome to this tutorial on working with raster or grid data with Python. In this tutorial, I will assume that you understand what gridded raster data are in comparison with vector shape files and that you are able to use a GIS software such as QGIS to visualize raster data files. I will use here the Jupyter Notebook G02-raster.ipymb from the course repository. I will also use here some sample data that you can find here at the repository of uh, the uh, River Architect software. So you can either download that or you clone the course repository and you will already have most data available here. This tutorial also requires that GDAL is available in your Jupyter notebook environment. So if you didn't do the shapefile, uh, uh, sorry, the shapefile tutorial before, um, just here again the hint. Um, when you're working with the uh, Fluss tools, you'll find instructions here how to create your um, IPython kernel for using Fluss tools in Jupyter Notebook. So you need to um, instantiate here uh, just a new kernel. Um, I call it the Fluss kernel. You can call it whatever you want. If you're not working with Fluss tools, you will find uh, guidance in the troubleshooting section. Um, go to Programming, Tools and IDEs, um, Debugging Jupyter, and there at the bottom you find here uh, hints of how you can add a new kernel to uh, Jupyter uh, Lab or Notebook. So I added here my Fluss kernel and you can switch to this kernel by clicking here on the kernel module uh, menu, click on Change Kernel, and then you can select here the kernel that you want to use. So I will use here the Fluss kernel. Now I'm able to import uh, GDAL. In this tutorial, I will also again show you a couple of functions that I also implemented in the Fluss Tools package. So you can access most of them directly from there and its GeoTools subfolder. So let's start with how you can load a raster in uh, Python with GDAL. I will illustrate that here with the uh, example of the open raster function that I will use still a couple of times here in this tutorial. So the very first thing that I will do here is I will import GDAL from OSGeo. Please note again, please do not type directly import uh, GDAL. So even though you install GDAL for your Conda environment or your virtual environment, um, you want to import it with this statement from OSGeo import GDAL. Then this open raster function takes two arguments. One is the file name and the other one is the band number, which is by default one. I use here GDAL exceptions to enable error messages um, and get it, or getting uh, details on error messages when I'm executing GDAL operations. Opening the raster then is quite simple in with GDAL. I just type here uh, GDAL, uh, GDAL dot open the file name and this will be my raster. Now what I actually want to do or for to have for working with it is the raster band. And the way how we get the raster band is by type uh, instantiating here a raster band object of the raster dot get raster band method. If one of these uh, commands here uh, runs into an error, I want to see what error that was, and this is why I um, embrace both commands here with try accept statements that are pretty big. Finally, this function returns the raster and the raster band. Again, you can find this 
um, open raster function if you would just type from uh, fluss tools dot uh, geotools import open raster. So that would give you the same function over here. If you write it like that, then your own open function, uh, open raster function will override it. If you want to have more guidance on uh, how Fluss Tools works or how GeoTools uh, works, you can go to flusstools.readthedocs.io. So um, that is uh, flusstools.readthedocs.io. Here you find uh, information on the Geospatial Analyze and GeoTools. And if you wonder how a function or a script works, um, that's all implemented here. You see what file, uh, what arguments it takes and what it returns. So you will find here also that open raster function, which takes a file name and the band number. And it returns here an OS uh, geo.g.dataset. So let's use this open raster function. For this purpose, I will use here the h001000.tiff, um, so a geotiff file that you can get here from the River Architect sample data. And these are also available in the course repository here in the geodata folder, rasters. You will find here h001000.tiff. The way how I'm opening that now here in Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab or Python is I will first define a file name for which I'm imported, I imported first also the OS package or library. Then I'm using here the open raster function to get the source, so the raster, and then the actual information that I want to work with, and that is the raster in the raster band. So that is here why I call the second one the water depth or depth just which is my data that I want. So let's run this little code block, block and you see here that the first one is my um, GDAL dataset, so that's the raster, and the second one is my raster band. Afterwards, here yeah, I'm releasing the raster band again by overriding it with a none. I just said that the actual information that I want to work with is in the raster band, including its raster band statistics and other things that I can do then with the raster band. If you're working with a desktop and GIS application such as QGIS, you will find many more processing options for uh, rasters and adding uh, on and accessing the raster band statistics. In this following example here, I will use a script to access some numeric and color characteristics of a raster band. This first function here just um, is an indication of how to use the script. And the second function here attempts to get the color bands of a raster if it has it. It takes the raster band as an input argument and then will try to open the get color, t uh, the color table um, with rasterband.getColorTable. If there is no color table in the raster, it will print that the, the, uh, the raster band has no color table and return directly none from the function. If there is a color table, it will print the color definitions. And then also I want to know the color bands and that's what is then, then this uh, code block you're doing. It returns a list of the color bands that are in the color table. I also added here in this script a main function that takes the band number and the uh, input file. So this main function would then use the open raster function from Fluss Tools and then open uh, here first the source and the band and then print the band minimum, the band maximum, the no data value of a raster band and the unit type of the raster. So this 
no data value is some default value that most trusts hold anywhere to assign or to uh, show where are no data available. This is typically something like minus 99999 in a raster band. But it is just important to know that that represents NAN values. So they should be excluded from statistics and by defining a, get a no data value for a raster, the raster knows which uh, values it should ignore. So that's a workaround uh, for not having something like the numpy.nan value in a raster band. This main function then will also try to print the color bands here if there are some by using the get color bands function. Finally here that if name equals main a statement um, checks first if the uh, number of arguments is correctly defined and if it is correctly defined we call the main function with first the band number that we want to use that will probably be then band number one and the uh, input file name. So you can either now copy these functions here and save them to a script or you just click here on that script, right click and uh, save as or you open it and save it as um, here on my virtual uh, Windows machine. I saved it in a temp folder and from there I, I can run it now, now as a standalone script with something like this. Um, command. So to run this now I will need to open something like Anaconda prompt. I will then activate the Fluss environment. I will activate the Fluss environment because here I have all um, packages and libraries accessible that I will need for running this script. So now I will go to my temp folder on my C drive where I saved the uh, script. So just um, that my temp folder is written with a capital letter. Now just check if the script is well in here. If you're working here on your C drive and you have then that geodata file saved somewhere else, you might also need to copy it here. This is just uh, for illustration. Huh? And now if you uh, want to run it, you can then just uh, copy here um, that command if you want and then just uh, insert it. The only things that I will need to change here is to make it a capital temp now. So what that command actually does is now it uses my Python um, here in my environment. Then it calls the raster band info.py script with two input arguments. The first one is the band number, so that's band number one. And the second one is the file name. So if I run that now, I should then get the results that are also visible here in the background of the Jupyter Notebook. Please note just that this um, script here uses Fluss tools. So if you're not using Fluss tools, um, you may need to uh, copy and paste the uh, open raster function into that script here. No, it took a while, but it ran. So for now we have opened a raster and we have seen its statistics or its band statistics. There are different raster drivers available in GDAL and to get a complete list here you can run this code block. So you have seen GeoTIFF until now but you will also see that it supports many other um, raster formats. And this is important now when we create and save a raster um, here, for instance, then from an array. Before we get there, still a word here on raster data types. So I listed here um, the whole palette of what you can find in terms of 
uh, raster pixel values. So those, those might be integers, might be floats, um, or complex numbers also. Now for creating a raster from an array, so that can be a NumPy array, I wrote down here that workflow that I will now illustrate um, with this create raster function that is then also available through FlussTools. This create raster function requires a raster file name and an array that it should convert to a raster. It takes a default value for the origin, so that the geographic origin of the raster that's none, a default value for an EPSG number, a pixel width um, that is 10 and the pixel height that is 10, an NAN value, so that was the thing with a not a number value for the raster that is minus 9999 9, and the raster data type that I define here by default with a float 32. So that stems from that list here. As an optional keyword argument here also implemented the geoinfo argument which can be a complete um, tuple on in the form of a geo data set get, uh, get geo transform object. So this would then supersede the origin, the pixel width and the pixel height. This geoinfo command is basically the information or could basically overwrite then all info on information on the geospatial referencing. So before I get there let's have a look at how the function works. By default, it uses the GeoTIFF driver, which is compatible with most uh, uh, JS desktop software. Then I'm creating the raster dataset with the required number of columns and rows. So um, I wrote it here just explicitly um, that the number of columns should be the raster array dot shape. Um, one and that here the number of rows should then be the shape zero um, argument here of the raster array. So that is what you um, provide here with the raster array uh, argument. Recall that should be a numpy array. Then if my if I if I do not provide here an geo info argument as it is defined by default, then I need the origin. So that should be a tuple of the origin coordinates for my raster. So the first element of that origin should, uh, raster, uh, tuple should be the x origin and the second one the y origin. With this information and the information provided on the pixel width and the pixel height, I can then create the geo transformation for my raster. If a geo transformation was provided, then I can use the geo information. So that geo information thing that should be a six entry tuple. To replace now NAN values in the NumPy raster, which is necessary because the geo tiff will not recognize the NPNAN format, I need to overwrite here all NUN values in the raster array with the NUN value that was by default minus 9999. Now I'm retrieving here the raster band number one. So you may want to flexibilize that here by adding a raster band comment, uh, argument, sorry, not comment. Um, now I'm adding um, the no data value to the band information and then I'm writing the array to the raster. By default here I'm setting the scale of the raster to 1.0. So while the band number is actually a flexible command in the Fluss tools function um, create rasters, it is not here. Um, the set scale is still uh, constant also there. Finally, here I'm creating now a projection and assigning it to a raster. So that is a little bit similar to what um, I have already explained in the shape file 
uh, tutorial where I'm instantiating first an OSR uh, dot spatial reference object and then I'm importing here the spatial reference as a function of the EPSG number. So the thing that should be a four to five digits um, integer number. Now I'm setting the projection um, as a function of the um, well-known text format that is associated with that uh, EPSG number. If you want to get more details on that, I invite you to have a look at the uh, uh, the shapefile tutorial where I talk a little bit more in detail about the um, uh, about well-known text format and DPSG numbers. So finally I am just releasing now here the raster band by flushing the cache of the application. So with that I can then afterwards also use my raster um, in a QGIS or something else. Still now here the hint, if you are, um, if you did not yet import uh, OSR, you will need to do that here um, with the from osgeo.import function. So you can um, uh, run now this uh, code block here to have the um, create raster from file name and raster array function available in the following, or you just import it from geotools of the Fluss tools. Uh, package. Now let's see that function in action. For that purpose I am creating here a new raster in the geodata uh, rasters subdirectory and I'm just calling that a random uh, randomized uh, dm point here and dot tiff. Now I'm adding here just a random elevation information um, by uh, using numpy's random.rand function. So if uh, numpy is not part of your basic imports, you will probably need to write here something like import numpy as np. Now I am overwriting uh, one pixel here just with um, the um, np.nan value. So just for uh, illustration purposes, what will happen to that pixel, because here I will need to use the default NAN value. Then I'm defining here a raster origin, and I'm using here the raster origin for EPSG 3857. Now I um, call the create raster function to create a one meter resolution raster, so that is why I'm using now here a pixel width and a pixel height of one. I'm assigning it the EPSG number 3857. The raster name stems from that line here and the array is my random um, numpy array from here. So now you can run that script. It will create here the random unisdm raster file or recreate it in the course repository or your local clone of that. Now um, I invite you to open QJS and have a look at your random raster. You can add maybe a base map to your QJS um, map so that you can verify that it is well placed on your map. To learn more about the base maps, uh, please have a look at the QJS tutorial. One reason for which you might love your desktop GIS application might be its, um, its capacity to perform map algebra or raster calculus. So to perform some math mathematical operations with rasters. So you can do the same thing with Python 2. Just in a coded manner and that can be the baseline for automating any workflow for a geospatial analysis that your computer can do while do, you can do something else. Before we get there, we need to define also a raster to array function that does basically the inverse of the array to raster function. Again, also this raster to array function is 
um, available from Fluss Tools, so in Fluss pool Tools, um, dot GeoTools, uh, there you find the raster to array function. So what does that uh, function do? Well, first, of course, it needs the name of the raster that it should use. And again, it needs the band number of the band that it should convert to a raster. What it then does is it opens the raster by using the above defined open raster function. It directly passes on the uh, band number that is here again by default an integer. Then it opens the band here as an array. So it takes the band from the open raster function and reads it as an array. Now it overwrites the NAN values with NumPy NAN values. So now we're doing exactly the inverse where before we had NumPy NAN values that we need to overwrite with a no data value for the raster. Now we are overwriting the no data value of the raster with NumPy NAN. Then this function returns now the raster, the band array itself, and the geotransformation of that band array, which might be very useful when we want to combine that raster with another raster for, for instance, after a calculation. Now, let's have a look at an example for for raster calculus with these functions that we defined so far. I will use for that purpose here the water depth file and the flow velocity file that is defined in as a u, so for typically for flow velocity in an x direction or streamwise direction. Now I'm loading both rasters as arrays, so I am instantiating that here. Um, through um, with uh, three variables. One is here my water depth, so H raster. One is the actual values of water depth, so just H. Um, that is not a super great variable name in terms of explicit uh, coding, but for that uh, little code block here, it's accepted like this. And I'm using the geo information of the uh, water depth raster. So I'm passing just the h file name to the raster to array function to get these three inputs. Then I'm doing here the same with the flow velocity raster. Now both of these rasters were in US customary units, but we want to work here now with metric units. So we multiply the numpy arrays just with 0.0. 3048. So what I will do now, I will calculate the fraud number for the um, as a function of water depth and flow velocity, um, which is just the flow velocity divided by the square root of water depth times gravity. Now to calculate uh, and to write this calculated fraud number to a raster, I will use the create raster function from above. I want the raster to be called FRS and for 1000 uh, CFS. So these 1000 here refer to a discharge in cubic feet per second. So while it is still for cubic feet per second, the numbers are uh, dimensionless in this case. As a raster array, I provide now the fraud number raster, and I'm using here the EPSG 6418, uh, which is the local um, uh, EPSG or G, um, geospatial reference to use for uh, this raster. As a geo information, I could provide now either the water depth or the flow velocity information, doesn't matter, I'm using here just the water depth. If I run that code block now, it takes again a couple of seconds and my fraud number uh, 1000 cubic feet a second uh, geotiff will occur here in the geodata rasters subfolder. I invite you now to have a look at the raster in QJS where you can import it and maybe use some nice symbology like a color ramp to visualize the fraud number 
in this section. If you have already been watching the tutorial on shape files, you have seen that you can reproject shape files. Similarly, you can reproject a raster into another coordinate reference system or projection and or projection. Such a reprojection of a raster involves that pixels in a raster might need to be rotated, shifted and also sheared. To perform such a reprojection, we first need to retrieve the um, source and the target geospatial reference systems. So that is basically what you can do with the above defined raster uh, to array function that will return you the geotransformation. Then we net need to read the transfer geotransformation of the source data set. So the thing that we provide and that where we want to get to. Then we need to derive the number of pixels and the spacing between the pixels for that new data set. Then we can instantiate the new reprojected raster data set um, and project the image on this new data set. So let's walk through that workflow step by step. I said already that we um, got already partially with uh, through work step one with the above defined function. What we still need now is a uh, function to uh, read the spatial reference system. We can do that here with that get SRS function that accepts a data set. So GDAL data set, remember that is the um, data set that we receive from the open raster function and is then passed through the um, raster to array function as an argument and returned also by that. So this function takes such a data set. Then it gets a spatial reference system using osr.spatial reference. It imports um, the, uh, from the uh, well-known text format the data set's um, projection, tries to auto-detect the uh, EPSG number which might not work for a couple of EPSG numbers. And if that doesn't work, it will jump into that conditional statement and look for matches. If you need to jump here into that match finding, um, you probably want to check if the match is also appropriate um, with, uh, visually, maybe in QJS. Now you want to assign here the input special reference, and you can do that by uh, with the import from EPSG method. The last thing to do for that function now is to return the spatial reference uh, func uh, sorry, the spatial reference object. Now we have the open raster function and we have the get SRS function. And these are now sufficient to write another function that I will call reproject raster. So that reproject raster function will take a source data set, a source spatial reference system, and a target spatial reference system. So the source data set is, again, just the raster, the GDAL raster. And the source and target spatial references are osgeo.osr spatial references. So the first step to do here is to read the source geotransformation, which is a tuple of six elements. So that's similar to what you've seen before. That will define here the source geotransformation. Then I derive here the pixel and raster size. So the pixel width is the first element uh, here in the uh, geotransformation tuple. So just remember Python starts counting from zero. So the first element here is that here. And then the pixel x size is the source data set dot x raster size and the y size is the right size. Makes sense. Huh? So now I want to ensure here that um, the transform point um, uh, um, function that we will use later on here uses x, y and, and Instead of yx, um, that is something that could hap uh, that happens with uh, GDAL version three. For that, I'm uh, assigning here the 
access mapping strategy to the source and target special references. Now I'm getting the coordinate transformation um, through uh, supplying to this function the source and the target spatial references. Then I want to get the boundaries for that new data set. It shouldn't be infinitely large. Huh? And by, uh, the way I'm doing that is first I'm uh, retrieving here the origin x, y and z coordinates through the coordinate transformation and its transform point function. So that's what we got uh, from uh, that, that we want to ensure currently working here. If you got a little bit lost here, maybe uh, just stop the video, have a break, read through the um, um, inline comments and have a look here at the geotransformation uh, tuple. So now then I'm assigning the maximum x, the maximum y and the new z um, coordinates to uh, that I want to use later on. So now I can uh, create a new in-memory data set um, with the uh, size of the raster. So that's just in-memory right now. To work with an in-memory data set, so nothing that's written to the uh, disk permanently, I need to check out here get driver by name man. Then I'm creating now my target data set where I'm using the maximum x minus the origin x coordinates divided by the pixel width. So that's going to create the x pixel numbers. That's and then the second one here is the y pixel numbers. And then I'm assigning here the GDAL float um, data type. So you may want to flexibilize that by, um, by making this here an input parameter of the function. So now I can create the new geo transformation with the origin x, the pixel width, the source geo transformation element of two. So um, that's uh, this one here. And similar here for the y coordinates. Only be aware that I need to use here a negative value for the pixel width. That's because of the way that I've calculated it here. So now I assign that new geo transformation to the tar target data set, and then I'm export. I'm using here that uh, projection as a function of the uh, well-known text format. So now I can reproject the source raster data set onto the new reprojected data set. This function here is in GDAL, it's called reproject image. You will also find it in QJS and it use, needs a source data set, then the target data set name, um, or um, uh, sorry, not, not, not only the target set data name, it needs here that memory um, uh, uh, driver, uh, that in memory data set. In QJS, you will probably just provide it with a name for the output, and then you uh, provide you with a, a well-known text form of the source and target special reference system. As a data set here, you want to use then gr, uh, g dot dot gr a bilinear. And then finally, you can just return the target data set. So let's run these code blocks here to have the functions available in the following. So what I want to do now is to take my fraud number raster from before and convert it into a format for a web frame. So for that purpose, I want to convert that EPS G number um, 6000 something that I used above and, uh, re, uh, and convert it here to the EPS G4, uh, 4326 uh, or 3857. This now here when this code block I first define then the source data set file name. So that's what we created before. And then the target um, or orientation file name that I call just here rasters um, dot web, uh, rasters web frame. So that lives here already in the um, 
in the uh, raster subfolder of the course repository. Um, if you do not have it yet, you can get it um, just by downloading it from here. And the reason why I'm using it here is just it simplifies a lot to get the geotransformation. So if you need to get a coded strategy, it might m help to just create a raster data set that doesn't even need to hold a lot of uh, content for the moment. Um, that raster data set should just be in the target uh, reference system that you uh, want to use. Then now I'm opening uh, both my source raster data set and then here in this case it's the orientation um, data set. So the thing that um, I just want to use for uh, orientating it. And now I'm retrieving the raster data sets uh, sorry, the spatial references of both using the spatial reference function. So I'm providing it here, the source data set, uh, set um, and the orientation data set. To double check, I'm printing here both SRSs to the console. Now I'm just flushing here the orientation data set because I don't need it anymore. The only thing that I want uh, for what I wanted it was here to get the special reference system or the new special reference system. So now I can use the reproject raster function um, with the source data set, the source special reference system and the new special reference system that I want to use. I need to provide it now just with a file name for the reprojected raster. Then the array data is what I'm getting here from that reprojected raster data set uh, as array then I can retrieve here the new um, EPSG number with uh, just the new SRS.getAuthority code, get the transformation from the reprojected raster and then recreate a raster with the reprojected file name, the rusted array data, the EPSG number and the geo transformation. So that is here the point where I was using this orientation raster. So now I just release here the reprojected raster and I will run the code. So you just see here the source EPSG, the target EPSG, and now you can use um, QGIS to visualize the resulted reprojected raster, maybe with a Google satellite imagery as background. This function is also available in Fluss tools. Um, you can also just click here to read uh, more about the implementation of it in this package. Sometimes you are only interested in a tiny share of your raster data sets um, and what values they hold maybe within just a polygon. I will exemplify an application of such zonal statistics calculation here for a particular morphological unit um, that is uh, slack water. There are other morphological units in, used in fluvial geomorphology and I invite you here to have a look here at the uh, literature links. You can either create this uh, sh shape file here for the slack water uh, geomorphological unit or you download it here as a zip file or you have cloned the repository already, then it is in your Geodata shapefiles uh, directory. So we will use here in this case the raster stats library and we will use again the water depth file and the flow velocity file from before. And as a zone, now I'm interested in the values of water depth and flow velocity within the slack line, uh, slack water polygon, not slack line. So to get the zonal stats now of water depth, I will use here RS, so raster sets, zonal stats with a zone file, so that's a shape file. Then the um, water depth file that I need to provide here, and then the statistics that I want to have. I'm doing something similar here with the flow velocity statistics. 
Here now I'm just using min, max, medium, majority and sum just as one string that also works. So let's run that code block and we get here the summary. So just know those are in feet and cubic, uh, not cubic, and feet per second. You can also um, apply your own uh, the statistics calculation that you want. Um, for instance, um, through the numpy.ma module. So I just defined here a function I call raster uh, standard deviation that returns here the standard deviation of a raster array. And now I can apply that here by using in the zonal stats function of raster stats um, a dictionary for standard deviation that uses now my own raster uh, standard deviation function. That can be pretty useful here because NumPy is pretty fast. Um, you might not know what it uses otherwise or if the uh, statistics are available anyway. So here we get now the minimum, the maximum and my additional statistics that is the standard deviation of the flow velocity. So if now we are just interested in that tiny share of a slack water, maybe in the water depth, we can clip the entire water depth raster just to that zone. We can do that with a zonal stats uh, library or package here by doing a little trick. For this trick, we define here an original function that does basically nothing. It receives a raster array and returns it without any manipulation. So let's run that code block to have the original function defined. Then I will use here the zonal stats similar as before. As stats, I'm just using here counts. I'm providing the water depth um, raster. And for the stats now, I am using the original function as additional stats, so basically nothing, just the raster itself. I'm also using here the boolean keyword, uh, option keyword argument uh, raster out, uh, setting it to true, and that will help me now to retrieve the uh, clipped raster. So you see here, those are the uh, resulting stats. I can also add now, I'll call you then now the um, mini raster uh, array to see its contents or just to instantiate it and then use again the create raster function to define just or to get just the clipped raster. If you were working with QJS, you saw maybe many functionalities in GDAL and then you try to uh, use your favorite search engine to find how that is implemented in the, uh, in Python's GDAL and you didn't find it, well, there's, that's not a problem, there's a nice workaround for that. That is, you can just use Python's sub-process library to run a GDAL command as long as you have GDAL installed in your system. So, for instance, if you want to create here a slope map with uh, the GDAL DEM function, then you can define that command as a string here in Python and then you would use subprocess.call and then see uh, the command um, variable here, so the string um, to run that code in terminal through Python. So for that purpose here, just make sure to set the shell to true. So you can do that now. Um, here's just now another example of how you can create an aspect raster, so to which orientation um, a, slope is, uh, a slope is facing, so to the west, north, and so on. So that's a similar command here to create an aspect raster, and that will result in something like that here if you visualize it in QJS. Now let's wrap up a little bit what we have seen and extend it by some new aspects. I will show you now an example 
uh, where we assume or I assume that we have maybe a fish that is position one and it wants to go to position two. Now the water level was pretty high and the water level is receding now. So it wants to get from the alluvial banks where you can swim right now uh, to the main channel as fast as possible to not get trapped somewhere in and cut off waters. So that could cause some uh, disconnection of uh, fish habitat. So that is just an image here um, from uh, uh, Kenneth uh, Lario, who made a pretty neat code for identifying um, hydro peaking um, pitfalls for fish. So to help now finding the fish uh, find the uh, shortest path. Um, we can do that with the scikit image library and I will just um, summarize now the steps that you need to take. Um, if you want to uh, dive here a little bit more into detail, I invite you to stop the video anytime, run and understand the code blocks. So first we need to understand how scikit image helps us to identify the shortest path. So for that purpose here, I'm creating just a random array of numbers with NumPy. So that's here our array. Now I'm importing here from, uh, from skiimage.grab the root through array function and I'm providing it with two points. So I want to get from point one, that is zero, zero to two point two, that is at position two, four. So zero, zero is here and we want to get to 0.24. So now the root through array function requires the slope image, which is just the array that I used here and defined here before. Then I'm defining, uh, then I'm providing it here with a tuple of 0.1 and 0.2. And here it indicates me now how to get to these points. And it does it by calculating the weight of the path. So it starts here from 0, 0, identifies the least cost to, to proceed here is going to 16, then to 12, so that's 1, 2, then it's going to be at 2, 3 and 2, 4, so that we are at the end of the array. Now we want to see how these, uh, this shortest path looks on an image too, so we can project the path on the image with this code block here. So we are cre and creating here the path that this script or that the, the algorithm here identified is the least cost path to use. So that's zero, zero again here, one, one, and so on. So now we have that also available in an array. Nice so far. So now there's just the challenge that we are dealing here with a kind of offset of pixels and not with coordinates. So if you want to calculate the root through array of uh, raster and its assigned band values, then we need first to, to convert the coordinates to offsets, to an offset. So that's what you can do uh, with this function. So again, I invite you here to stop the code if you want to uh, look at that in detail. This function is also available again in those tools. Now we can create the path array um, by using the root through array function applied to a raster. Now to integrate that or to apply <coughs> that function, I first need to use the raster to array function. Then I can use the create path array function. So that one here, don't forget that run that code block here to have it available or you use it from plus tools. And then I'm uh, retrieving here the special reference system that I will need then to create the raster. So that here is now the workflow for, for, for creating a least cost path, path through the slope percent and, out, uh, and to create a least cost output raster file. So we assume or I assume here just that the fish will take the least slope costs to get to the um, 
into the uh, main channel as fast as possible. I define then here as next here the as points 1 and 2 as tuples, still in EPSG 6418, so with the original rasters. Then I'm loading the source raster and its array, so the raster array and its geo transformation with the raster to array function. So we're here now. Then I'm getting the spatial reference of the input raster, so that's here the slope percent raster. And then I'm creating the least cost path with the create raster function and the result of the create path array function. So now we can run that code block. Sorry for the little break, my computer was getting hot and a bit noisy. And in this code block now I first import again here the root through array function. So that may, may take, a, uh, take a couple of seconds. And as a result now, I will have here the least cost uh, geotiff here in the geodata rasters um, subdirectory. So that's what you can find here. Now you can visualize that in QGIS. And in a next tutorial, I will come back to that least cost Geotiff to convert it to a shapefile. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and it helped you a little bit. If you want to deepen your um, knowledge about raster handling, uh, please have a look here at the Geospatial Eco Hydraulics exercise. Thank you for watching this video.